And uh, James, today, chapter 5. But this week and uh, next week, I think I'll finish up with uh, James uh, next week. We're going to go back and pick up a couple of verses that um, uh, went past as we were preaching, dealing with uh, patience, the art of patience. John Dewey said, patience is the most important virtue in all of the world. Uh, you may be like the lady who prayed, Lord, give me patience and give it to me right now. <laughs> if you're wanting to know more about patience, the Bible has lots to say about uh, patience. And so we're looking today in James chapter 5. I'm going to begin in verse uh, 7 as we read today. James chapter 5, verse 7. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient. Stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard Job's of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. So in this passage, James is writing to uh, some people who had a tendency to be impatient. They were people that, and really what they were impatient about was the second coming of the Lord. They were anxious for, they had heard that the Lord was coming back and they were anxious for this to happen and so some of them were perhaps willing to quit their jobs leave because the lord is coming and and they wanted to be ready and stand in there waiting some of them perhaps were ready to go and stand on a mountaintop and wait and, and call for him lord come right now come we're ready for you um, to be here today we've got to be patient and we oftentimes are anxiously awaiting the second coming of the Lord as well. But let's face it, we need patience to deal with the little things in life. Uh, there are little things if they're in somebody else's life. The same thing in your life is a really big thing most of the time. A teacher had uh, just finished teaching for the day and she was in, a, in one of our northern um, states where there's a lot of uh, rain and snow, first grade teacher. She had just put um, boots on 32 first graders. Got the last little girl and she was putting her boots on and just as she put her last boot on of the 32 pair, the little girl said, you know what teacher, these are not my boots. <laughs> so the teacher did the boots and took them off. After she took them off, the little girl said, they're my sister's boots. She let me wear them today. <laughs> so she put the boots back on. That is what patience is. Let me give you a definition of patience. Patience is the ability to stay put and stand fast when you'd like to run. Sometimes we face uh, situations where really what you'd like to do is run and get away from whatever it is that's causing you the problem. Patience means that you don't run from those problems. But then sometimes we face situations where we wish things would go a little bit faster than they're going. And so patience doesn't run ahead of God, nor does it run from problems. So you need to understand when we look at this word patience here, it's used several times in this passage, but he's really using two different words for patience. He's using the word patience and perseverance. Patience usually refers to dealing with people. So when you're dealing with people, you need patience. Perseverance is really talking more about when you're dealing with a, a situation, a problem, something that's going on. So really in life, the only things in life that we face are people, and situations. So we really need to do something about patience. And the Bible puts a lot of emphasis on patience. Proverbs 16, 32 says, better to be patient than powerful. Better to have self-control than to conquer a city. 
He says it's better for us to have control over ourselves than to have control over a full city. The Bible says that's what it's like to be patient and to have self-control. You know what IQ is, intelligence quotient. What if there was a PQ, a patience quotient? And IQ, the higher the number is, the better you are. In patient quotient, how well you're able to be patient, then a high number would be good. What would be your patience quotient? Uh, I read, uh, found an article this week that I read, um, why are people impatient? And I thought it was gonna be funny, but it really wasn't. It just was some stuff about being um, patient various reasons why people are uh, impatient. Um, oftentimes when people have a short attention span, and you know some people like that, when they have a short attention span, oftentimes it's easier for them to be very um, impatient, and they tend to oftentimes get angry really uh, quickly. Um, waiting too long oftentimes awakens our impatience. This happens when you're standing in line someplace waiting to pay, or there's a delay at the airport, or something else, you're waiting for something else to happen, so impatience oftentimes um, creeps in. If somebody makes a promise to you and they don't fulfill it, then you might lose your patience, and oftentimes that leads to anger and unhappiness and a lack of satisfaction. Uh, when you're around people who move or act slowly, then you might get impatient. When you're paying in the grocery store, and of course the line you're in is always the slowest one. Um, if you come to the grocery store and I'm there, don't get in the line I'm in. Every other line is moved faster than the one uh, that I'm in. When the driver in front of you doesn't go when the light turns green, because they haven't finished that text message they're working on, then sometimes that causes you to be impatient. This last week I went by the post office. I really did not get impatient about this because I'd already been working on this message. But I went by the post office and there weren't very many cars there. When I pulled up, I, I got there and this lady parked about the same time I did. And when she got out of the car, she was hurrying to get in before me. I didn't really care. So she went in in front of me. Um, I usually try to hold the door if I know there's somebody coming behind me. Luckily, I didn't expect her to do that or I would have gotten hit with the door. But um, she went in, she spent about five minutes. I had one envelope. And I had the 50 cents in my hand because all I needed was one stamp. There was only one counter that was open. She spent about five minutes talking about those, um, if it fits, it ships. And so whatever you can fit in the box, it goes. And she was having trouble understanding that. And I'm, I'm telling you, it took five minutes. And then you know what she bought? Nothing. She just came in. She spent all of that time. And then she left. And then I spent my 50 cents and got the stamp that I needed. If you've got a lot of tasks, if you've got a lot of tasks to carry out, then you may become impatient. Working long hours and desiring to get a quick response that you don't can cause people to be uh, impatient. Everybody who's made it far in life has figured out how to deal with um, patience. Uh, so as I read through this at the end of this article, then this person, um, Ramez Sasson, so he had a book that he wanted to sell. And uh, I did look far enough, I didn't get the book, but I looked far enough to see part of what was in the book on the outline. The book was Strengthening Your Willpower and Self-Discipline. And one of the keys to strengthening your willpower and self-discipline is develop patience and perseverance. The book was 1795 and this message is gonna be free, so you'll come out ahead before the day. So how, how patient or impatient are you? How do you deal with interruptions? How do you deal with inconveniences? How do you handle irritations? How do you, how do you handle inactivity when there's just nothing going on and you just are stopping? For some, that is, um, some people call that rest. Other people just get really irritated when that happens. So let's talk about the prescription for how you handle, how do you develop the art um, of patience? Maybe you've heard somebody say, or maybe you've even said, don't pray for patience, because if you do, you'll have all kinds of trouble that comes your way. Well, I'm going to tell you, if you don't have patience, you're going to have all kinds of trouble that comes your way. So you're doomed if you do and doomed if you don't. So you might as well work on 
um, patients. So four things. I'm going to tell you, these are about the, the easiest things, and especially the first three, you're going to say, really? Do you, I mean, do you really need that? The, these are, they're so simple. If you, but if you will do them, I promise you, it'll make a difference um, in, your, um, in your ability to deal with um, patients or inpatients. The first one, develop a new perspective. Develop a new perspective. What does perspective mean? So we have different perspectives today. I can see most of you all's face, faces. Most of you, unless you're sitting on the front row, you're looking at the back of somebody else's head, and you can see me. The people on the sides, you can see their profile, and you'll wonder if you've seen a picture of them with that profile somewhere. But So you have a, a different perspective um, than I do. Um, so what I'm, I'm talking about on perspective, you need to have a, a, a different perspective. A spiritual, if you develop a, a spiritual new perspective, a new way of looking at things, then, then here's what it means. Quit looking at things from your own perspective. It's, it's easy for us to become selfish and for us to develop um, tunnel vision where all we think about is ourselves. It's ego-centric is what it is. When your ego, yourself, you're at the center of your universe and everything else and everybody else revolves around you. You judge things the way they affect you. And so you talk about my life, my plans, my ambitions, my goals, my schedule, and all of those are the things that you're messing up. And so the more selfish we are, the more impatient that we will be. Whereas on the other hand, if you begin to look at things and try to see things from somebody else's viewpoint, it will drastically change how you look at things and how patient you are. When somebody treats you dirty or says something bad to you, when they irritate you, ask this um, question. wonder why they did that. <coughs> maybe, maybe they've really got a bad headache. Really. Maybe um, they didn't grow up in the same kind of home that you grew up in. Maybe they just got, or somebody in their family just got some really bad news from the doctor. Um, maybe if you would try to understand where they're coming from, it would change the way you would look at the situation. By the way, did you know that the real success to anything in life, any endeavor in life, the real success is looking at things from the perspective of the other person's life. If you want to be a better husband than husbands, you need to try to understand things from your wife's perspective. Wives, if you want to be a better wife, you need to understand things from your husband's perspective. Parents, if you really want to be the best parent, some of the things you need to understand from the child's perspective. Children of all ages, because as it turns out, all of you are children. I was talking to somebody this uh, in the last two days that was telling me about their, I don't remember how old her mom was, uh, 87, 88, 89, and she was saying that she was trying to help her with some stuff, and her mom said, I do not need a babysitter. And she was probably right. But children of all ages, if you want to be the best child, look at things from your parents' perspective, because it'll really make a difference in how you decide to deal with stuff. If you're in business, the best thing for a business for success is to think about way, uh, think about things from the customer's point of view. So if you would develop a new perspective, look at things through the eyes of other people. So before you become irritated, before you become impatient, look at things from the perspective of somebody else. Did you ever hear somebody say this? Somebody was acting a little bit um, differently. There was something odd, at least to you, in the way they were acting. Did you ever hear somebody say, you ought to walk a mile in their shoes? All they're really saying is, wonder if it would be any different if you saw it from their perspective. That's all that means. So, number one, develop a new perspective. Number two, display a sense of humor. Did you know that humor and patience are first cousins? There's a, a relationship between a sense of humor and patience. I am, I am so blessed to have 
uh, kids, my, my boys and their wives that are all Christ followers, and they are living out their Christian walk in front of their kids. And so and that's, that is how that's supposed to work. That's how they ought to understand how to walk the Christian life is because they see that in the lives of their parents. So at a very um, young age, my uh, grandkids, they always wanted to say the blessing um, before we eat. And so when we would uh, go out, whether it was at home or whether we'd be at a restaurant, then they oftentimes would sing this blessing. God our Father, God our Father, we thank you, we thank you for our many blessings, for our many blessings. Amen, amen. Now you ought to hear what happens in a restaurant when several of my, because they, they all knew, when several of them are singing that, we've been in restaurants several times when everybody in the restaurant got quiet because they could all hear the blessing and they all needed it. Um, and so, but that's what they would do. So um, my youngest grandson, Cole, we were eating last um, Sunday lunch. And when I said, uh, who wants to say the blessing? Um, Cole said, he wants to say the blessing. And so Cole has heard them and he's participated in this but last week he did the blessing all by himself and um, here's what he said too many blessings too many blessings oh man oh man <laughs> now now listen if you will you didn't like that <laughs> listen if you will think about that that's really a pretty good prayer too many blessings oh man so we need to have a sense of humor. Proverbs 14, 30 says, a relaxed attitude lengthens a man's life. In other words, it teaches, he who laughs, lasts. That's, that's what it's, I'm saying. Proverbs 17, 22 says, being cheerful makes you healthy. Jesus said in John 16, 33, in this world you will have trouble, but cheer up, I have overcome the world. They say, I don't really have anything funny uh, to laugh about. Well, laugh at your troubles. If you laugh at your troubles, then some of you will be able to say, I got plenty of things to laugh about. Am I right? There are, there are things you can laugh at. Listen, God has a sense of humor. I don't know where we came up with this idea that he is some kind of a cosmic killjoy that is waiting just to make things difficult or harsh for us. In Psalm 2, verse 4, it says, He who sits enthroned in the heavens laughs. He does laugh. He does have a sense of humor. And you don't have to believe me. Look at an orangutan. Can you look at that face and not think he has a sense of humor? Or look at the person sitting next to you. No, you better not do that. Listen, some of you, some of you are just, you're a bit too serious. And you may say, well, life is really serious. And I think you're right. Life is serious. And you ought to take life seriously. But don't take yourself quite so seriously. One of the best marks of maturity, emotional maturity, spiritual maturity, is the ability to laugh at yourself. And so if you have reached a level of emotional maturity, then you can laugh at yourself, at your problems. And you can laugh at your circumstances. Whereas the people who have not reach that level of maturity, they can't laugh at themselves. And so you know what they do? They get mad. And so they, when they can't laugh at their circumstances, they get mad. And they just steam and they boil over at their circumstances. circumstances. There's a correlation between maturity and patience. Little children are the most impatient people. I mean, when you ask them for something, you ask, they ask you for something and you say, not now, what do they say? Can I get it now? Can I get it now? When can I get it? When can I get it? And it just goes on and on. And sometimes the littlest ones then will pitch a fit when they don't get what they want. There's been some research that has been done on a depression, on clinical depression. And one of the physicians who has pioneered this research, uh, clinical uh, uh, doctor Hans Seeley, he's discovered that there's a correlation between laughing and emotional healing. And he says that even people who force themselves to laugh are more well adjusted. So even forced laughter will help you. It's therapeutic for you. You know, the problem with some people is that you remember the Greek mythology, God Atlas, 
Remember Atlas and he's carrying around the whole world and what a difficult job and, and oh the responsibility that he had every single day to have to carry it around the world on his shoulders and some of you think that you are Atlas and that you've got to carry around the whole world and I just want to say to you, you've got to lighten up. Somebody else is carrying around the whole world and he's got the whole world in his hands. And so it'll be okay. So what I'm saying is, take life seriously, but don't take yourself so seriously. Jesus said, you're going to have problems. But he said, cheer up. I have overcome the world. And so try laughing a little bit more and see if that makes you a more patient person. So number three. So first you need to have a, a perspective, a new perspective. You need to display a sense of humor. And then number three, you need to deepen your love. Make your love deeper. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. That's the chapter on love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 4 says it about as simply as it can say it. Love is patient is exactly what it says. Love is patient. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 2 says be patient with each other making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. Proverbs 19 11 says a man's wisdom gives him patience it is glory to overlook an offense. And so if you look at both of those verses, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2, Proverbs 19, 11, the Bible says the more we love, the more we love people, the more we are going to be willing to overlook their faults. And the Bible says if you have real wisdom, sometimes you will overlook an offense. Now, I might stop here and just mention to you um, I'm not going to say very much about this, but um, back in the middle of that passage where he's talking about um, patience, all of a sudden he gets to verse 9, and to me it's kind of an interesting and even odd verse when you, when you get to it. It says, don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. So right in the middle of all of this talk about patience, he tosses in this verse about grumbling, and you might say it's just in passing, the one thing that ought to get your attention, your attention is it says, or you will be judged. If I'm going to be judged, I'd kind of like to know what that was about, and really what I want to know is what are the consequences. And, and so, um, so well, at least look at this, let me just give you a couple of things. What does grumbling um, do for us? Paul says there's a better way for us to live, working out our Christian life without complaining. We're living in a fallen world. It isn't always going to be the way that we like it, and people around us aren't always going to uh, are always going to be doing the things that we like for them to do. When we complain about them, we offend God and position ourselves for His judgment. Remember the um, probably some of the most frustrating things for God in Scripture is when uh, the children of Israel are uh, they're supposed to be going into the Promised Land. Uh, they don't make a good choice, so they aren't. And so you know what they do for the next forty years? Grumble. And if you read through the passage, this may bother you when you first read, but when you read through the passage, what he says is because of all the grumble, grumbling, then you're going to die. And what happened to all the people who failed to go into the promised land? They wandered around for 40 years. And you, you realize what all was going on during all of the grumbling? Uh, they had food that showed up every morning, that they had plenty to eat. In fact, the only problem with the food was when they gathered too much and then it would spoil. But oddly enough, on the weekend, before the Sabbath, they could gather enough, and on that day it wouldn't spoil. And you remember what happened to their shoes and their clothes? They didn't wear out for 40 years. Could that not have been amazing? There's, they grumbled and complained. The Israelites did not enjoy God because God did not do exactly what they wanted Him to do and when they wanted Him to do it. So they grumbled and they grumbled and they grumbled. People. Um, who enjoy God are much different than they were. If you ask them why they thought uh, they could count on God, they would quickly tell you about half a dozen reasons how God came through uh, when they needed Him to. And so um, he puts that verse in there, I think, to remind us not to be grumbling. But this third point is deepen, deepen your love. Here's what it means. If, if you love people, you will be patient with them. The more you love a person, the more you will be patient with them. The opposite of that is also true. The less loving you are, the more impatient you are. Husbands, um, you're to be patient with your wives. Wives, you're to be patient with your husbands. The more you love someone,
the more patient you'll be with them. By the way, it's sometimes dangerous to pray a prayer, Lord, give me patience, because you know what He will do to teach you patience. Listen, we learn more during times of struggle and frustration than any other time. So if you want to be patient with people, you know what He's going to send you? Yeah, He's going to send somebody that you really will have to work at trying to be patient with. But it will teach you um, patience. It's also dangerous to pray a prayer, Lord, teach me to love people because um, you don't think for one moment that God is going to send you somebody who is kind and nice and Christ-like and loving. He's going to send you somebody who's frustrating and irritating. And in the process, you will learn to be more loving. The more you love somebody, the more patient you will be with them. And then the last thing, number four, those first three, you just put forth effort and you can do those. This last one, there is some effort on your part, but this last one is a work um, of God. The last thing is depend upon the Lord. Ultimately, patience is not something you just summon up within yourself. Uh, some of you, if, if we had had a score on that patience quotient, the PQ, it would have been a, a low score. You know it would because you know you are not very patient. And so some of you may say, I'm going to be more patient. I'm going to be more patient if it kills me. And it probably will. Because really, patience is not something that you just work up. Patience is something that you get because of what God gives you. Patience is a fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5.22 it's, it's something that the Holy Spirit produces in you. And there are uh, some of you that are straining and trying to be more patient. But the patience comes when you learn to wait upon the Lord and depend upon Him and ask Him to allow you to be more patient through His power and through His strength. You know, the, the problem with a lot of us is we get in a hurry oftentimes and the Lord is just not in a hurry. We, we want God to do it right now. And God just says, not in a hurry. I, I, I learned this lesson um, some time ago, but the, the lesson is with God, timing is more important than time. Timing is more important than time. I want something done and I want it done right now in a space of a short amount of time. And God's not in a hurry. You remember when Jesus and his disciples were uh, preaching? And he got a message from some friends. And the message was, Jesus, your friend Lazarus is sick. And they need help. And Jesus said, I will get there. And then you remember what he wait, did? Waited two days until he left to go that way. And can you imagine what Mary and Martha are saying? Where, where is he? Why isn't he responding to our plea? I wish you would go ahead and, and come on. Have you ever prayed a prayer? Like that, where you said to God, I need this prayer answered, and I need it right now, and God didn't seem to be in much of a hurry. Jesus waited for two full days, and he, then he finally went to Bethany. And Mary said, if you had just been here, if you had only moved a little quicker when we wanted you to, Jesus said, hang on, you're going to see more of God's glory if you just will wait. And so, you know what happened. Lazarus died. He's been dead for four days. He's, the Bible says that Jesus went to the place where he had been buried and he said, Lazarus, come forth. And you know why he said Lazarus? Because if he just said come forth, then everybody would have called. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And so, he, he came forth. So now think about this. What gave God greater glory? To revive a sick person or to raise a dead person? Amen. Raising a dead person. Sometimes, sometimes God is going to wait and do something uh, in your life and we've got, to, we've got to wait. In fact, it may even be a divine delay so that He can show Himself. James gives us three good examples then of Patience. The first one is the example of a farmer. He says, be like the farmer. You know, a farmer has to, to be a patient man. He's got to be trusting and waiting on the weather and the elements of God. And so he says, be like the farmer. And then he says, consider the prophets. They were righteous 
they preached, but they suffered. They were patient. I heard somebody say that um, one time that the, the pigs and prophets and uh, pigs and prophets and poets all have something in common. You never fully appreciate them until they're dead. All three of them. The prophet, nobody's ever, the prophets are never um, famous while they're alive, but after they die, then they are um, almost always popular. The third example that he gives us is the example of Job. And he says, consider Job. You know the story of Job, how God said to, to Satan, look at my servant Job. He's a righteous man. He hates evil. He's a good man. And the devil says to him, well, sure he's a good man. You've blessed him. You've got a hedge of protection around him. Um, of course, you remove that hedge of protection and he will curse you. And so God says, all right, um, I'll allow you to bring some tribulation into his life, but I'm going to limit what you're able to do. And he did. He told him he couldn't um, kill him. And so I, I hope if you get anything out of the story of Job, uh, it is just absolutely true that sometimes God allows suffering in the lives, in our lives, in the lives of um, Christians. So Satan said, okay, um, I'm going uh, I'm, I'm to take care of Job. And so Job is sitting on top of the world, wealthy, rich, happy, wonderful family. In one day's time, all of his livestock is either stolen or killed. All of his crops are destroyed. His 10 children are all in one home. A tornado comes along, all of them are killed. So in one day's time, he gets more bad news than most of us will get in a lifetime. And he fasted and he prayed and his wife said to him, Job, just forget it. Curse God and die. Shake your fist in God's face and say, God, how can you treat me so dirty when I'm a good person? Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt that way? God, I don't deserve this. I mean, I'm a pretty good person. I don't deserve this. Curse God and die, she said. Then, three of Job's friends show up. If you have friends like this, you don't need any enemies. Those guys, they came along and they looked at him and they raised their eyebrows and they said, so Job, what have you been doing to deserve all of this punishment in your life? And maybe some of you that are going through a fire right now and really honestly, you didn't do anything to deserve all of this, but you're um, suffering. Finally, Job comes to the end and even before he sees the light, he says, I know that my Redeemer lives and I'm going to see him again one day. He kept his faith in God in the midst of his trials. You know, the, you know the end of the story. God said, listen, because you have been faithful to me, Job, in this testing, I'm going to bless you. And he blessed him twice as much. He, when he replaced what he had lost, he had twice as many cattle, twice as many sheep, twice as many camels, twice as many donkeys, twice as much money. Um, he had 10 more children. And the Bible teaches that Job lived for another 140 years. But we, we focus on that short span of time when his life, when he was suffering, but he lived for another 140 years and enjoyed all of the blessings of God. So there may be some of you that are going through a really difficult time right now. A time like what Job was going to. In the end, listen to this, in the end, God was glorified and Job was purified. As a result of the patience and, perse and perseverance, God was glorified and James was purified. I, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what kind of uh, people that you're having um, to deal with. But ask God to take control and trust Him in the middle of of the suffering that you're in. First Peter chapter 2, the Bible says, if you do right and you suffer for it and are patient beneath the suffering, God is well pleased. The suffering is all a part of the work that God has given to you. Christ who suffered for you is an example. So follow His steps. He never sinned. He never told a lie. He never answered back when He was insulted. When He suffered, he did not threaten to get even. He left his case in the hands of God who always 
judges fairly. So, if you want to be more patient, look at things from a different perspective. Develop a sense of humor. You've got to smile sometimes. Ask God to make you a more loving person and then depend upon the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for